how are we doing here? Am I active? Great. Thanks very much. So I started my career actually as a computer scientist. And then one day I learned that cells and computers aren't actually that different, at least at a certain level. And I said, that's cool. And so here I am. I want to more or less pick up where Rick left off and focus on some of the more computational issues that made the Human Genome Project possible, as well as get to this issue of biological networks and circuitry. What I want to focus on is, are there lessons in particular that we learned computationally in the Human Genome Project that we can now apply to defining not all the genes that's been done, but now how they're all wired up in this, in this global network we have in each one of our cells. So I'm going to talk both about earlier computational efforts to understand the genome, and then hopefully we can see how those apply to networks. But just to make sure we're on the same page, and I think Rick covered this at the end of his talk really well, the idea is that each and every one of our cells function is driven by a network, okay, consisting of some number of components, DNA, genes, in other words, RNA, proteins, drugs, hormones, and other small molecules, uh, sugars, for instance. And then a complex set of wiring in between all of these components. And virtually any of these components or types of components you can imagine interacting actually do, in fact, interact. So proteins interact with proteins to create enzymes and other molecular machines. Proteins bind DNA to turn genes off and on, as Rick was describing. Small molecules can interact with DNA and proteins. For instance, drugs can inhibit proteins through small molecule protein interactions, and so on. So we have all of these different components and all of these different interactions, and those together comprise this molecular circuit we're talking about. And by analogy, I'm showing in the background here such a circuit uh, from electrical engineering. So every Pentium chip has a, another very large circuit in it that we understand because we built. So can we also understand the, the molecular circuit inside every cell? Um, it's this circuit which helps the cell or, or dictates how the cell responds to changes in temperature and other changes in the environment, as well as internal events that go on. Um, if we had this blueprint, then implicitly, or, or at least this blueprint would definitely be required to really understand which interactions go awry in cancer and other diseases. And if we had this blueprint, we'd also have a leg up on understanding how we could then target these interactions, which have either short-circuited or, or disappeared abnormally. How can we target those problems using drugs or gene therapies? But first we have to get the blueprint, so how do we do it? Well, like I said, let's start, let's, let's switch gears for a second and start with the Human Genome Project and discover how, how do people make sense of the human genome and, and uh, what were some of the computational techniques that were applied there. And then in a, uh, well, in the second half of my talk or so, we'll then see how we might be able to apply those understanding this circuitry that everyone's raving about these days, uh, as Rick said, over the past just a couple of years. Okay, so the Human Genome Project started, well, was first proposed in the mid-80s. And this just shows the buildup of DNA sequence um, in the public domain, in, in the public databases over the past 20 years, starting in, again, 1980 or so, and ending more or less in the present day, a couple years ago. You can see that the number of base pairs of DNA in, in GenBank, which is the biggest repository of DNA in the U.S., is exponentially increasing at much the same rate as the Internet is in size. So the size of all the sequences out there and the size of the Internet are, are both exploding. Um, turns out the Internet is doubling a little bit quicker than, than the genome uh, databases, which is not a bad thing. Um, I think the Internet doubles about every year and the genome databases double in sequence about every 18 months. They've gotten a lot bigger with, with the mouse sequence uh, when the mouse sequence was recently deposited in, in GenBank. So lesson one to be learned from the Genome Project is if you want to study a system, study all of its parts. Gather all the sequences, okay, like people have done here. Lesson two has to do with once you've done this, how do you make sense of it all? So now that we have, in fact, I checked on the web today, and it looks like uh, there are now about 18 million DNA sequences in, in the public DNA sequence databases. Uh, and that's, if you break that down into individual base pairs, that's about 23 billion or gigabases. Um, if I were to give you a file on your computer 
with 18 million sequences in it, and I said, here, go understand the cell, what would you do? Well, you'd be really confused. At least a lot of people were very confused. And in fact, back in about in the mid-'80s to even through 1990s, people were arguing we shouldn't even do this because, hey, you're going to have all this information in the form of DNA and protein sequence, and we're not going to be able to make any sense of it, uh, at least at the level of how a cell really works. Well, it turns out what people did was develop what are called search tools. And these are computational tools to let you pull out particular DNA and protein sequences from these eight, this big file with 18 million sequences in it. So what, and this, this is in fact uh, the most common tool people use. It's called BLAST. It stands for Basic Local Alignment and Search Tool. This is the website you get if you go to this, this web address here. It's at the um, NIH or a government website. What you do is you type in your particular sequence of interest. And so what I've done here is just taken a uh, sequence that I had laying around on my computer. It's a sequence of A, C's, G's, and T's, DNA. You, well, you can either type it in A, C, G, T, A, C, G, T, or you can paste it in, which is what most people do. And then you press search. And it gives you a result something like this. What you see here graphically is echoed down here in text. Graphically, we're seeing my query sequence, shown as a red bar. So this, this represents the linear DNA sequence I typed in. You can't see the individual base pairs here, but you get the length of it. And here are one, two, three, four sequence matches, shown in green, and five more shown in black. And what is being shown here is that this part of that green sequence matched to this part of my query sequence. If you go down here, you see those same green sequences and then black sequences repeated as text, and there are web links you can click on to get more information about those genes. So what we've done is we've searched this query sequence, the one I just typed in here, against this entire database of 18 million sequences and pulled out just the ones that have a similar or identical match. Now, if I were to click on any given one of these links, I would get a page that looks like this. And this lists the actual match down to the base pair between my query and a particular sequence in the database. And you can do it for every sequence that you hit. And so what you can see here is my query said GGATG, and that sequence that it, it pulled out said GGATT. So it differed here, but it was similar at four out of five of those nucleotides. And you can score that. You can try to say, well, how likely was that to have occurred by chance? Well, it turns out this is a pretty good match, so not very. And this is just blowing that up in case you, you couldn't see that before. So each one of these bars represents an exact match between those nucleotides. And the absence of a bar in the middle here means a, a mismatch. The G did not match the T. The C did not match the D. And so what it's actually doing very, very quickly is it's taking my query sequence and it's comparing it to each one of those 18 million sequences in GenBank by sliding them back and forth until the largest number of base pairs come into register. When it does that, it says, okay, well, this is the best I could do. And it skims off the very best alignments from the 18 million it looks at and returns them to you. Now, because there's not just human sequences in that database, but there are sequences from a variety of species, rat, chicken, squid, worm, yeast, there's some bacteria, E. coli, we can use these sequences to understand something about evolution. So this, is, this is one example of what you might do once you've done one of these BLAST uh, queries. So here, say, with the, uh, in, in fact, this is now, I should point out, not DNA sequence. These are protein sequences. So there can be not four letters at any given position, but 20 for the 20 amino acids. And so this is another query where I took a human sequence, and I pulled out the best matches from rat, chicken, and all these other organisms. They're shown here aligned all to each other where each column is a different position of that alignment that was the best match. And now we can use them to build an evolutionary or phylogenetic tree. So you can see here rat and human are closely connected in this tree. Somewhat further away is chicken, somewhat further away from that is squid. So what's happening here is the distance between any two organisms in this tree is proportional to the differences in their protein sequences. So the closer your protein sequences are, in this analysis, the closer you will be in, in this tree. And so that you can see in the, in the grand scheme of things, 
of the species that I happen to focus on here, human and rat, were a lot more similar in their protein sequences than, um, for instance, these two yeasts are. These are two um, different yeast species. And look how different they are compared to rats and us. OK, so this is just an example of what you can do given this huge database of 18 million sequences in, in what's called GenBank. And it's also an example of, of how you might make sense of, of that information. And the answer is you take a particular query sequence of interest or a set of query sequences. And you pull out just those sequences that match your queries. Otherwise, it's very hard to make sense of that whole database. Now, as Rick was alluding to in his talk, that was all made possible by the ability to sequence DNA and proteins very, very quickly. Um, in fact, I had a bet with um, uh, another researcher. Uh, the, the original schedule for completion of the Genome Project was 2005. But this company called Solera came along a couple of years ago and um, catalyzed the whole community to sequence DNA much, much faster, so it's, it's already complete. Um, so I, uh, Rick, do you know how long you think it would take someone right now to sequence a human genome? A year, maybe? A year plus or minus some, some error term there. <laughs> um, However, for the rest of my talk, I want to talk about a, a whole host of different experimental technologies we have for characterizing not the genome itself, the genes themselves, but the, that circuit or network in which those genes act. And as Rick said, just in, what's so exciting is just in the past year or two, all these technologies have come down the pike for rapidly characterizing these, these wires in, in the circuit themselves. And there's a, there's a variety of different parts of the circuit we'd like to characterize quickly, and we, and we can now. One is what's known as protein-DNA interactions. And this is uh, a section of the protein DNA, or what's also called transcriptional network, behind sea urchin development that was published in the past couple of years. Um, but to be explicit, what I mean by protein-DNA interaction is a protein called a transcription factor that comes along and binds the DNA just upstream of a gene. So you can imagine a DNA sequence here that represents a gene. The protein comes down and it binds to that and either causes that gene to be turned on, making RNA and protein, or turned off, not making RNA and protein. You might imagine you have a whole ch chain of events where protein A binds gene B, gene B makes a protein which binds gene C, and so on. You could have feedback loops. Gene C might come and bind gene A again. The point is these are all organized into a very large and complex networks, network. The second type of interaction which is of interest to us, and we can now measure at very, very high throughput, is known as a protein-protein interaction. And just to be explicit here, what I mean are uh, two individual proteins that can come together in the cell and bind each other, either stably to form a larger complex, or transiently. Sometimes what happens is one protein will just kiss another. Maybe in the process, it'll modify the second protein in some way, so it goes on and does its business. Either way, we call those a protein-protein interaction. And people are now mapping large, large networks of these in the cell. Finally, a third really important type of, of network that people are, are learning how to characterize, although somewhat more slowly, I must say, than these two, is what's called the biochemical reaction network. And so these, uh, some of you might have seen on your um, science room uh, walls what's called the big Behringer-Mannheim wall chart of biochemical reactions. So each one of these uh, compounds here gets converted into another compound via an enzymatic reaction with some accessory molecules. And so that's what's happening here. We're, con we're converting, for instance, homoisocitrate into oxaloglutarate and so on down the chain. And as you might imagine, this itself is a huge network consisting of thousands of these substrates or, or metabolites and thousands of enzymatic reactions converting one into the other. Now, the really exciting thing here is our ability to measure, if not all three of these levels, at least these two, very, very rapidly. And I'm not going to go into any of these technologies here, but feel free to ask me more about them. All I want to point out is that for each of these levels, for protein-DNA interactions, Rick, Rick actually talked about a technique called chromatin immunoprecipitation. I couldn't fit immunoprecipitation on my slides. I put IP. Um, for, for measuring these at very, very high throughput. If your interest is in protein-protein interactions, we have a number of techniques. One's called protein co-immunoprecipitation. Another is called the two-hybrid system. 
for measuring these networks uh, at very, very high throughput. So you can imagine, for instance, taking, uh, Rick mentioned that there were 6,000 proteins in yeast, distinct proteins in yeast. Um, you might imagine comparing all of those 6,000 proteins to every other to see if a binding happens between those two proteins. People are doing that, and it's defining a very large network of these. Unfortunately, there are not really uh, high throughput techniques that I know of, of defining metabolites and, and how to convert one metabolite into the other via biochemical reactions. However, over the years, in a bottom-up sense, people have defined very large networks of these. So we, we at least have those in the computer, and we can build models from them. So how are we integrating all of these networks together into models? In, in the last uh, question and answer session, someone asked Rick about uh, might you be able to, to model these, these networks in a computer to predict cell function? Well, we're trying. <laughs> um, and here's what those models are beginning to look like. Here's a section of that model uh, in the neighborhood of a process called galactose utilization. Uh, this, this is how cells, uh, cells can feed off a variety of sources. Um, they prefer to feed off glucose in most cases. Uh, but they can feed off of other sugars and fats as well. Um, this is the circuit needed for feeding off of a sugar called galactose. A particular node in this network represents a gene and the protein it makes. So this is the GAL4 protein here. Um, and the wires or links between nodes represent either protein DNA or protein-protein interactions that have been determined by these new high-throughput experimental procedures. And again, there's different procedures we use for that than for that. But the point is, just like we have now, just like the Human Genome Project has given us this huge database of 18 million sequences, we now have growing databases of protein DNA and protein-protein interactions. And here's a region of, of the network defined by the, that database. So for instance, we can see here that GAL4 connects to GAL7 and kin and 1 and some of these other genes via a protein DNA interaction. So again, GAL4 then that indicates is a transcription factor that comes down and binds the DNA upstream of each of these genes and probably affects whether that gene gets transcribed, gets turned on or off. Those are the yellow arrows. A blue line represents a protein-protein interaction that's been experimentally determined. So for instance, this indicates that the GAL80 protein can physically bind GAL4 protein in the cell. And it turns out in this case it's known what happens there. Uh, when the GAL80 protein binds GAL4 protein, it inhibits it, so it cannot transcribe these genes. To give you an example of, of one thing a protein-protein interaction can do. And, okay, so that's, that's the network. Now on top of this network, we have some colors or intensities. And this is rep representing which genes are turned on or off in response to a particular perturbation of this network. Here the particular perturbation has been to knock out the GAL4 gene. So I should say this is all done in yeast, and in yeast we have a very, um, a very ready mechanism for going in and sniffing out a particular gene sequence so it's cleanly gone. It's called a gene knockout, and we've done that for GAL4. So GAL4 is not making, it's not turned on. It's, it's not there. Well, what happens when you remove GAL4 from the system? Well, you affect some of these other genes. This is a scale for how you're affecting them. If, uh, if the color goes towards black, that means the gene is being turned on to a greater level, making more RNA and protein. If the color goes towards white, it means, like as for instance in the case of GAL7 and 10 and 1, it means the gene is being turned off, meaning it's no longer able to make RNA. So we can see here if we were to knock out GAL4, what happens is that GAL7, 10, and 1 all turn off. The important point is we can now look in this network model to come up with hypotheses for why. Here it's quite simple. GAL4 binds to these genes. Thus, it makes perfect sense that if you delete GAL4, it will no longer be able to turn them on. So that's a region of the network, but I've been deceiving you because the whole network is, in fact, quite large. So because of these high-throughput efforts we now have, we have about, if your favorite organism is yeast, 6,000 or so protein DNA interactions that we know, and another 20,000 or so protein-protein interactions. And here's what happens if I were to take the view I just gave you and now zoom out to a bird's eye view and show you the whole network. Still, we have the yellow protein DNA interactions, and still we have the blue protein-protein interactions, but we can no longer see individual nodes. And now we're stuck back with the question that we had with the genome sequence before. How do we make sense of this huge amount of information? Okay. 
Well, let's think back to how we made sense of the genome deposited in, those 18 million sequences deposited in the public databases. What we did there was we had, the key was to have a query sequence, some letter uh, sequence of G's, A's, C's, and T's, or a protein sequence. We compare that sequence to every sequence in the database and pull out just the ones that are similar. And that then defines a family of, of what are known as homologous or similar genes. Um, we can build, we can use them to understand evolution. We can also infer that if we know the function of one, we can infer the function of the other based on a similar sequence. How can we apply that technology now to pulling out modules and circuits from this huge hairball of, of interactions in the database? Well, there's, there's a lot of different ways that are going to emerge, um, undoubtedly. I'm going to take you into just one of the ways we're using to, to pull out circuits from this hairball of interaction. What you want to do at a high level is you want to find some particular cellular response of interest. That could be a particular cancer that interests you. It could be a particular network, like I just showed the sugar or galactose processing network that interests you. Whatever. But once you've identified a, a very specific process of interest to you, what you want to do is you want to query the network with that process to pull out just those interactions and pathways and complexes of interactions that are associated or important for that cellular response. That's the idea. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, again, there's many ways that we can think of doing this. Here's just one of them. The trick here would be to use the DNA microarray, and, I, and Rick described to you briefly how this works. I'll describe even more briefly how, <laughs> how it works. <laughs> um, feel free to ask me after the talk if, if anything's unclear. The idea is perturb the system or perturb the network with your process of interest. So if it's cancer, look at a cancer state versus a normal state. If it's, in, in the case of our galactose circuit, it's perturb individual genes in that galactose circuit or, or add sugar or withhold sugar. There's a variety of perturbations you could design to, to get at the network itself. But in response to that perturbation, Measure what the genes are doing with the DNA microarray. Are the genes turning on or off, and which genes are turning on or off? And again, this is a picture of a DNA microarray. Each spot on this DNA microarray represents a different gene. And if the gene is turning on in response to your perturbation, the spot lights up as a green spot. And if the gene is turning off in response to your perturbation, the spot lights up as a red spot. Otherwise, it, it stays yellow or, or black. And again, this technology really just came down the pike in the past, oh, seven years or so. Uh, and it allows us to query not just specific genes, but every gene in the network to see if it's changing. Once you've done that, the idea is to integrate that gene expression profile with the network to pull out just those regions that are most affected by your perturbation. So here are the steps. One, gather the large network. And that's an ongoing process that's, that will happen over several years. Um, we now have a very large network for yeast. We're in the process of fleshing out what that network looks like for human and mouse. Once you have that large network, perturb the cell with a perturbation designed to hit your pathway of interest. Okay. In response to that perturbation, determine which genes are changing. Are they going from on to off or off to on after your perturbation? Well, find out which ones they are. Step four, computationally integrate those changes with this network. Run them into a computer algorithm, which we can write, and pull out, turn the crank here, and pull out which regions in the network are changing in terms of their genes in response to your perturbation. Here's a case where we did that for that galactose circuit I showed you before. We designed seven different perturbations, each to a different gal gene. Here's this, this del symbol or delta symbol means that gene has been deleted. That's the biologist notation for a gene deletion. So here's a gal 1 gene deletion, a gal 80 gene deletion, a gal 7 deletion, all the way on down to a gal 5 deletion. And we've now pulled out which regions of the network have genes that are most affected by that perturbation. Here's one of them labeled 1A. Here's a second one labeled 1B, and so on. There are five shown here that scored significantly 
meaning most of the genes in, in these networks are changing when we apply these perturbations. And in fact, that's what this matrix up here shows. For each of these networks, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and 1E, we're showing which of the perturbations affected their genes. So we can see that for network 1A, a gal 1, 80, 7, 10, and 2 perturbation affected these genes. But these genes were not affected by a gal 6 and 5 perturbation. And that's a very different signature from, say, that of network 1B, and very similar, to, or actually identical, to that of network 1C. Again, each of these networks has some collection of protein-protein, shown in blue, interactions, and protein-DNA, shown as yellow arrows, interactions, which were present in that original hairball. So they've been filtered out just as you might filter out sequences from the genome. We filtered out modules or regions from that large network that appear to be of interest, appear to be affected by our perturbations. And again, as you look at more and more perturbations, you can pull out lots and lots and lots of different regions which are applicable or, or important for different perturbations. And so what's going to be fun as we develop these, these networks for human is to be able to say, here is my disease of interest. What regions of the network are responding to my disease or drug. So I've shown you one way of applying this kind of idea that was used so successfully in the Human Genome Project to tell us virtually everything we know or have gleaned functionally about, about these gene and protein sequences. I, uh, I've talked about how we might apply these to learning about the protein interaction network that's now being defined over the past one or two years. This is my small but growing lab at the Whitehead Institute as one of my collaborators. I want to thank Rick's lab for supplying us with all of these protein DNA interactions um, as, as his lab cranks them out. Um, we have, as you might imagine, many collaborators and we're supported by uh, a couple of grants in particular, uh, one from Pfizer and one from the NIH. Thanks to Melissa and the organizers of this conference for inviting me to talk. Well, first, I would like to thank you for, I think, to be quite a fascinating presentation. For the first part of your talk, I would like to ask about the difference between one human being and another. And if you do the study from one tissue sample to another in the same human being, maybe taken on different days, how much variation uh, would there be? Well, even more simply, just in terms of the basic genome that you were started out with. Yes. I know about the supposition, but I'd be interested to know what the data show. Oh, well, so, so that's not my area, but my understanding is that uh, as, especially as cells age, the genomes get chopped up quite heavily. And maybe Rick's probably in a better position to answer that question as, as far as how the genomes are changing from cell type to cell type and mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, uh, certainly the, the idea is they start, you know, when a cell divides, all the genes are the exact same. But over time, um, as the cell ex experiences environmental factors and damage, things happen. And no one actually really knows how much damage to a genome the, the cell can withstand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're describing, um, you know, sort of protein-protein interactions. How far are they on tertiary sequences of proteins in terms of how many they know? Oh, as far as structures, is that what you mean by tertiary sequences? Tertiary structures of proteins, yes. yeah. So, so wouldn't it be great, right, if we could take the genome sequence, which tells us what all the genes are, which tells us what all the proteins may be, and then from those linear protein sequences, figure out how they fold up into three-dimensional structures, and then from those three-dimensional structures, determine which, pro which pairs of proteins must be able to interface and dock to one another, causing protein interactions, or which three-dimensional structures must be able to bind DNA to. So in other words, could you simply predict this whole network from first principles from the genome? Okay. In theory, uh, peop I think the answer is going to be no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but there are certainly some people who would argue with that. 
Um, and there's a, a very you know, a, a very much alive community of, of protein folding. Um, to, to get to your question, what, what percentage of proteins have known folds? I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, do, you, do you know the answer to that, Rick? More than half. There's something like Moore's Law for computing where you know, the number of transistors yep. on a chip and the cost. And I'm wondering if, if there's been enough data to see whether there's a trend that would show uh, um, you know, when I might be able to get my sequence done in a couple of days for like less than $500 or so. So, so uh, the doubling time of GenBank is about 18 months. That much I know. Now, extrapolating from that, um, you know, where is, where is, what was Moore's law? What was the doubling time? Was it, was it about 18 months also? I think the number of transistors in a chip doubles every 18 months. I, I could be getting that wrong. But I, I know for GenBank it's about 18 months. Um, we can maybe sit down and, and do some back-of-the-envelope calculations to figure out uh, what that means for getting your own genome sequenced. 